I want to start out by, I mean, I've been to a lot of these conferences, and you, know, you, you go to these things and somebody gets up on stage and starts talking about agile or pair programming or, you know, there's a whole slew of different things that is the newest thing, whatever the coolest thing is that week. And you all sit there and I'll be like, yeah, yeah, test first development, that sounds great. I'm going to go home and I'm going to try this out. And I go home and try it out and for whatever reason it doesn't work for me. Like, it works, but it doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, I, I give it an honest shot, but I just can't get into the zone, I can't get stuff really working really well. And for a long time, you know, that's been a really bummer for me. Um, if, like, agile and stuff works for you, that's great. Software development is hard enough. Um, but for someone who can't get into these official uh, development practices, that kind of sucks. And that was sort of my life for a long time, where like none of this stuff really worked for me until I sort of started figuring out a different way of working. Um, I never really liked a lot of process, um, and I think that there's a lot of ways to work within uh, software development without having adding a whole bunch of different process and weighting you down. You can still move really quickly, you can still have a really cool team, you can build really cool features, um, and you don't need to have this crazy other uh, development process. So that's all I'm going to talk about today. Um, I want to talk about how GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub. Uh, the secret is this is not really about GitHub. Okay, it's sort of about GitHub. I use it three times in the title. Um, but I really think I would give this talk if I worked at like Twitter, if I worked at Facebook, or anywhere else. Um, this is not really about GitHub. Uh, this talk is more about how your company can use GitHub uh, to build your own product. Um, and again, this isn't really about our tools and our software that we actually built. This is more about our workflow. Um, our development strategy, our methodologies. I think what we've sort of figured out over the last few years of GitHub existing is really cool and it works for a lot of different companies. Um, so I'm Zach Holman, I'm Holman on Twitter, Holman on GitHub. Uh, I do work for GitHub. Um, I hate doing this stuff, but show of hands who uses GitHub, knows GitHub. Awesome. Um, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, I've been at GitHub for the last like year and a half or so. Um, so I was in point number nine, and now we're at 45. Uh, so that's grown a lot in the last uh, you know, year and a half. And I think I've sort of been in a position to see what has worked for us over the last year and a half, what hasn't worked for us, um, and more importantly, you know, how we've grown as a company. What sort of assumptions do we make a long time ago that has worked out really well for us today? Um, so first of all, I want to talk about a little bit of how we physically work. Otherwise, this talk will probably sound insane. Um, we work asynchronously, and uh, you know, asynchronously is kind of a weird word. It's thrown around a lot. So I looked it up in a dictionary to what, see what it actually means, and it says you can do shit without needing to pull me out of the zone. I read really edgy dictionaries, um, and what that means for us is that we have no meetings, we have no deadlines, and we have no managers. Um, we have a very open way of doing things because it's all about getting people into the zone. We want people to be really happy. We want people to be really excited about coding. And we have people who get in, in the office at like 7, 8 in the morning because that's, they're excited to attack the day and they do all this stuff and those people are definitely not me. And we have, you know, a lot of people like me who, you know, will show in the office at like noon or 1 or whatever. Um, and that's because I work better in the afternoon. I work better at different hours. And we want to help support that. We found out that like deadlines, um, strict work hours, you know, very rigid work atmosphere that people have been touting for so long actually gets in the way of things. Every time you've been really involved with code and you've had to be pulled out of this uh, in the zone feeling to deal with some manager's problem, you guys all know what I'm talking about here. It sucks because you have to get back in the zone. That's the worst part. Um, so a little bit more detail. What does it mean when we're asynchronous? Uh, we do everything in chat rooms. Um, if it's you and me in the office at 2 in the morning and we're on the same table, I will still talk to you over chat, um, just because it's a lot more efficient in a lot of ways. Um, I can count the number of times we've had actual meetings, maybe on one hand, since I've been there. Um, and that's because of that second reason, everything is logged. Um, I can step out for lunch, and I can see everything that's happened in the company ever since I've left. Um, I can go out to France for a couple days, and I can see everything that's happening uh, back at home. Most people have been drinking right now, I don't know why. Um, and again, time flexibility. It's really about getting people really excited about what they're working on. And you can't do that sometimes if you mandate strict hours. Um, I wrote a lot more about this. It's like a three-part crazy 
blog posts and stuff. So if you're interested in the actual details about how we work, um, check that out. Otherwise, I want to talk about some other stuff. Um, this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I want to talk about pull, re pull requests and branching, um, which is sort of specific to GitHub, sort of specific to just software development in general. This is really what I think distinguishes GitHub. Um, I also talk about issues, because everybody has issues and ticketing systems and all that stuff to deal with. Uh, I want to talk about OAuth as identity, and then hooks in Hubot finally. So first of all, pull requests and branching. Uh, again, this is sort of what makes GitHub GitHub, I feel. Um, and I want to start up first with branching. Um, we use Git at GitHub, obviously, but this stuff sort of works for Subversion or CBS or any sort of stuff. Um, you guys have weird branches, and I say this with love, but like I, I go through a lot of support requests, and I see people branching code differently, and I talk, I'm talking about um, you know, branching your development code into a feature branch or something, or getting ready to deploy. Um, this is the foundation of what your code starts with. If you build it on a really complex branching strategy, it bubbles up to a really complex product. So I think the most important part here is to build a really simple branching strategy. Um, like I said, I've sort of been working support a lot, so I see lots of weird uh, branching strategies, especially from like enterprise customers, and they have stuff like this where they have like a master branch, like the main branch that everybody works on, and then they deploy that to a deploy branch, which is kind of cool, and then the next week after that's deployed, they deploy to another deploy branch, and another, and another, and what happens is that you actually don't know where the current state of the project is, which seems really crazy. I see this all the time. Um, something more likely to show up, especially in large companies, is say you have a repository that everybody works on, and then you have a set, I'll call them trusted developers. These are the guys that have full rewrite access to this repository and can do whatever they want. And then I'm, you have another group of people, I'll just call them shitty developers. <laughs> um, and they must be shitty developers because they are cordoned off in some area that like they don't get the keys, they can't push, they can't like you know deploy the site. They're they're apparently shitty. That's why I would like that's what it feels like to me. Um, and what they do, at least in a lot of what I've seen, is they all have to fork out. They each separately go to a separate fork, and then those forks have to get sent back to the trusted developers to figure out, oh, is this fork good enough to go back to the main repository? If it is, it gets merged back in. If it doesn't, it goes back to the shady developers, and they have to do something with it. Meanwhile, they're rebasing back to the main repository. But hint, if you see a workflow like this in your company, something is really mad, bad. Um, try to avoid this stuff all the time. Keep your branches simple, if you can. Like, Really think through, do you actually need to have all these separate permissions? Do you have to have all these separate, you know, detailed branching strategies just because that's what the process calls for? Um, so how does GitHub do branching? Uh, we start out, we just have a master branch where everything is deployed from, and then if you're going to build a bug, uh, bug fix or a feature or anything like that that goes on a separate branch, but when you're done, that goes back to the master. This is our entire workflow. It's much simpler. You can bring somebody on board as a designer, and they can easily push it to a, uh, a branch and push back to master. It's very easy to figure out. Um, there's less overhead to deal with. Um, alongside that, everybody can push, everybody can deploy. Um, that means you know the first day somebody can push to their branch and then deploy the site. We let our designers deploy the site. Um, we let our customer service deploy the site. Everybody, and that's you know kind of frightening, but it it, it gives the responsibility back towards the people who are in charge of their change. Um, it frees your time up for micromanaging other people's code. If you're the trusted developer, you, the last thing you want to do is try and figure out if this other guy's code is good enough to go back in. Sometimes that's unavoidable, but for most development work, you don't actually have to worry about that. You want the people who are in charge of the changes to worry about whether or not that will cause bugs, that will de uh, destroy the site, and stuff like that. Um, so for GitHub, master is always deployable. This is our main branch. If you push the master, you can assume that it is going to get deployed. And that's sort of the, the ironclad rule of GitHub. Um, this is because we deploy 10 to 40 times a day. Um, we like to deploy really quickly because so we'll know what breaks right away. Um, and it, it, it's really helpful because we no longer have these long, week-long iterations where you have to figure out, okay, we're deploying this, 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 and then there's bug in this, but you can't roll back with that because there's all this other stuff deployed. It's just much less risk to deploy constantly. Um, if you're nervous, deploy to staging. We have a separate staging environment. Um, or you can deploy a branch. We can also deploy to a subset of our production boxes. We have like 50 servers now, 50, 60. So you can deploy to one or two servers just to see if there's any um, errors raised or if there's any major problems. 
um, you can limit your exposure by being smart about how you deploy stuff. Um, we also, <laughs> we're a popular site, so this is sort of Twitter-driven development, where if we fuck up, you guys usually complain faster than we do. Um, so it's a good way of us like figuring out, well, you know, somebody's complaining, therefore something must be broken. We have a lot of uh, graphs and stuff, so we can chart out uh, you know, number of mentions of GitHub on Twitter, and then we can layer deploys against that, and usually you can see which deploys for something that's um, That's kind of an interesting way uh, byproduct of deploying frequently. Um, so keep your branches simple. I think if you have a firm foundation on simplicity, I think it's much easier to build a simple product on top of a simple foundation. Um, I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, everybody can deploy? That's insane. Like, what about code quality? And that's true. Um, this would be insane if this were the only deal that we dealt with. Um, but for that, we have pull requests. Uh, oh, the pull requests are really great. Um, pull requests are a code review. These are how we keep code quality so high. This is how we deal with lots of people committing multiple times a day and deploying all the time. Uh, so what are pull requests? Pull requests are discussions. It's a discussion about a change on uh, the code that's going into production. Um, so I mean, more on that, it's, it's a discussion on code, it's a discussion on features, it's a discussion on uh, a particular strategy. If you're trying out something new, you want to say, oh, I kind of want to do this new feature, but I'm not actually sure if this is good enough yet. It's a good way to have everything in one place to figure out, is it a good idea or not? Um, what's more, um, you can have, do lots of different things inside these pull requests. You can reference different issues, you can see the actual code diffs, and then you can write code comments and have more discussion on this. And this all happens on a separate branch. So it's, this is the, the point prior to reaching the master branch. Um, this is just a separate branch of Git. So this is actually what it looks like. This is just a sample one. Um, I want to go over it kind of more simply. A pull request starts out with a title, and then a description of that pull request. This is a nice, easy, high-level view of what your changes are. Then you're not going to have to dig into the code and figure out what is this guy actually trying to do here. And then you just make commits to those branch. Uh, the more commits you make, it'll show up in that pull request, and then somebody can see, oh yeah, I see your commit now, I'm going to discuss this. And we're going to you know, comment back and forth on this, see if that makes sense, and then you make more commits. That's all it is. It's a discussion of how you go across. Um, at the top of each pull request are these things. It's just three separate buttons, or this, the, the sections of a pull request. Um, one is the discussion where you actually talk about the change. This sort of takes the place of actual sitting down in meetings. Like every time that you project code onto a screen, I cringe because I've never been in a meeting where that has ever made sense. Um, and nobody has a laptop here, no one's pulled down their changes, no one can like run it themselves. It's a lot easier to talk about changes when you have it in front of yourself and you can check out the branch yourself and test it out. Um, there's also a tab on commits where you just see a high level overview of which commits are going into this branch. Um, and then there's one on specific code changes, the diff uh, between that branch and master. So I sort of lied, this isn't exactly our process at GitHub, it's more where you still branch off a of master, except that still goes through a pull request, and when that pull request is ready to go in, you merge it back into master. Uh, still, it's very simple, it's a very easy way of uh, figuring out what's going on. Um, your first day of work, you can you know, commit to the main app, which is kind of cool. Um, and I don't think we could have this without a really simple process. Big secret. You don't need to fork anything. Um, that's sort of what I see the problem with a lot of people thinking about pull requests, where they have to have a repository and then they have to fork that repository, send a pull request back and forth between the two. Um, you don't have to. You can do a pull request between master and another branch. You can do a pull request between a branch and another branch. Um, you can do a lot of different stuff with pull requests. Um, so four specific reasons why pull requests are rad. Um, one, asynchronous, no meetings. Um, this is mostly a reaction to my old company where we had all meetings all the time about code and you just sit there and like it's nine in the morning and you're just like, I don't care about this. Like you want people to be responsible about the code in their own way, not have to sit down arbitrarily. Um, they're asynchronous. If, if I do a pull request today, I can assume someone will probably see it within the next day or two and then get to it and then respond to it as their time sees fit. So I don't have to pull anybody else out of their zone. Um, it's just ready to go when it needs to be uh, shipped out. 
Um, notifications is really cool. Um, we get a pull request every time, or you get an email every time you get a pull request, um, and I kind of use that as an interface. Um, you know, I can be asleep in the U.S. and I see you know American or, or European employees doing stuff as I sleep. And when I wake up, I don't actually have to go through each line. I can just see like the descriptions and say, oh, this is what they've been working on the last day or two. Um, and it's a very easy way of communicating ideas across the company without actually having to sit down and do meetings and stuff. Um, and they're also accessible. We use uh, pull requests across the entire company. Like our designers will use pull requests and post mockups as they go. So it's sort of version control screenshots of their mockups. Uh, we also use them for non-technical staff. Um, we use this. Um, we have various stuff like our, our we have a shop where we can get all these you know, gear. Um, but that's run by somebody who's not necessarily technical. And if we change something in the shop, this is a good way of saying, hey, check this out. Um, does this make sense for you? Um, and it's, it's an easy way for the, to let them comment on stuff rather than having them say, all right, check out this code, switch to this branch and get, which is the most confusing thing ever. Um, it's, a, it's a nice, accessible way of presenting differences to the rest of the company. Um, they're also historical. Um, Poor request should be experiments. Um, you should be able to feel like you can go and do whatever the fuck you want and not assume that it's going to go back into master. We do have a lot of pull requests that start out saying, um, this is not destined for production. I want to see if this interface makes sense. Or, you know, does this class make sense? And that's really powerful because then you can get a discussion on that particular piece of code and you don't have to make it really heavy or anything like that. It's all in one place. And you can delete the branch and then we'll keep track of the history ourselves. And that's it. Um, so I also want to talk about a couple of our pull requests, just so you can see sort of concrete examples. Um, again, I was saying, like, you guys usually see when we're down before we do. I mean, we see it, like, within 30 seconds, but there will be tweets right away and stuff. The problem was that the old status site didn't have a real-time indicator of, like, you know, is this service down? It would just be a manual process of, yes, it was down 20 minutes ago and stuff. Um, so this is a pull request I opened up basically to add real-time polling to the status site so we can display, yeah, is the, the Git processes down and stuff like that. Um, so you start out, I didn't even care about the interface, it ended up being just like this, just spit out, is the Git service down, is you know, our, our download stuff, is that down, and just print out true. And I didn't have to care about the interface because I figured somebody else would come along and say, hey, this is a cool idea, I'm going to make a design for this. And this all happened asynchronously. I didn't have to track down a designer and say, hey, can you do this for me because I have no design skills, make it look pretty. Um, that just happened uh, just on the account of them tracking what I was doing. So once I had a design, I can add a bunch of commits. Um, and we went back and forth on discussions and whether or not the commit was cool. And eventually, you know, it all worked out and it was fine. We merged back to the master and that was it. It's a, a really nice, easy way to uh, track discussions and not make it feel like a heavy process. Um, so the takeaways from this is sort of mix your designers and developers. Like this is sort of a technical stuff. Anytime you talk about branching strategies and code diffs and stuff, most designers sort of freak out. And like I don't want to have to deal with that stuff. Don't be afraid to like do that. They don't actually have to see the code. They can just see your high level descriptions and go from there. It's really powerful. Um, also post screenshots is really helpful. As soon as you can get a screenshot on board, that gets people arguing about stuff right away, which is good. You want people to attack ideas really quickly. Um, and animated GIFs are great for pull requests just because they're hilarious. Um, we do those all the time. Um, another one we had was Code Mirror, which I don't know if you guys have used it, but we have syntax highlighting on our text area boxes if you're doing our code editor and stuff now. So this is a pull request that was open in like February and was closed in like March or April. And it's all this discussion and commits back and forth. And eventually, Kyle at the end is just like, fuck it, I can't do it. It's too hard. Close it. So this never made it into production. And that was cool because we had a long discussion on why it didn't make it into production. And eventually, like in August or something, we added support for a different library that does the same thing. And we could go back to this and say, oh, this is the design we were thinking of. This is what our initial intentions were. And it's just a historical record of going back and you don't have to reinvent the wheel for this particular feature. Um, and that's cool. You should be able to feel like you're experimenting all the time. Pull requests are really cheap. You just make one and then you can delete them when you're done. It's not that big of a deal. Um, don't fear, be afraid to toss it all away. Experimentation is awesome. Um, sometimes it's more beneficial to know what doesn't work. 
than trying to constantly shift stuff to production all the time. Like you want to try out new things and figure out does this work, does it not work, and get feedback immediately. Um, don't be afraid to just go wild. This is a pull request that was open you know, earlier this year. Still hasn't shipped, may not ever ship, but it's just got, you know, it's got mock-ups and stuff here, it's got commits all over the place, lots of discussion, and it's great because somebody, we can hire a designer or something tomorrow and say, okay, you want to, you should work on this feature, check out the entire eight months of discussion on this. And it's super powerful because they don't have to ask these people. These people probably already forgot what they were talking about earlier. But this is a record of what they were thinking at the time. It's super just powerful to do this sort of stuff. Um, so if you use pull requests, um, there's a couple things you can do to really improve them. Build a fast test suite. Um, you want to be able to make commits to your pull requests really quickly and know that they pass your tests. Our test suite is like 250 seconds or so. Um, and that's, that's an important thing for us. Slow down the test suite, that's as bad as a bug, basically. Um, also, CI should test each branch. When we push a new branch up to GitHub, uh, Jenkins automatically creates that branch, checks it out, and uh, runs tests on that branch, so you don't have to manually do any sort of branch level uh, configuration, which is really helpful. Um, and Brennan screenshots, that's the uh, syntax and markdown. Um, we use that a lot. Um, so, pull requests about getting shit done without waiting, wasting a lot of time. Um, I really think this is something that is underused and really powerful if you happen to use GitHub, which I would probably suggest you do. Um, but if you don't use pull requests, I mean, just think about it on a broader level. Like, can your workflow be, be improved? You really need all that process. And there are cases where, yes, you definitely need to you know, do this arbitrary thing that has been done for a long time. But a lot of times you don't have to. And this is sort of the thing that you have to constantly evaluate um, in terms of process. Can you simplify this process? Do you need all the stuff of this process? Because this is the stuff that if you let it get away from yourself, you won't notice until months down the line. And then by that point, it's really hard to change stuff. Um, so just continue to try and figure out, can we improve the developer workflow? Because that directly ties to developer happiness, which directly ties to uh, a good product. Um, so use pull requests more, ship a lot of stuff, I think they're awesome. Uh, I want to talk about issues next, because everybody has to deal with issues, tickets, bugs, whatever you want to call them. Um, everybody's seen stuff like this, a new issue screen. And all this stuff sort of makes sense at some point. Like somebody was like, oh yeah, I need this in here. But after a while, it really starts adding up. You're like, do I actually need three different priorities and stuff on this? Like, does this even make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Before you know it, like, to create a simple issue, you have to go through all this stuff. And even though it may take you know, 10 seconds of your time, it's still a mental challenge. You're like, now I'm going to do all this stuff. Do I even want to do this? Is that a big deal? Should I just leave it? Because fuck it. Um, you want me to post that picture? <laughs> um, so this is what the new issue is on GitHub. Um, again, this is not about GitHub the tool. It's about evaluating your own tools and figuring out, do you need that stuff? Can you make it simpler? Um, we just have a title and a description and then some optional markdown format if you want to do that because simpler is better. Um, people say that all the time about building products. Like, I build a simple product because simple is great. And then they go back and use like the craziest developer tools possible because that's just how you do it. Um, I would challenge yourself to try and build on simpler tools. Can you make your own products on simpler tools? Can you work faster? Can you work better on simpler tools? Um, one of my favorite man crushes on the internet is Merlin Mann, uh, Hot Dogs Lady on Twitter. And he, got, uh, he wrote a blog post on email uh, priority, basically. Where he said, a priority is observed, not manufactured or assigned, otherwise it's necessarily not a priority. Making something a big red top top, big highest number one priority changes nothing but text styling if it were really important it would already be done, period. <laughs> and I think that's really true. I mean. You know, everybody's sort of gone through the priority stuff where they like say like, yeah, this is super critical, but like, yeah, it's super critical. Like, the database will crash tomorrow. Like, is that like mediocre? Is that like a pink priority or a red priority? Like, people know this stuff, and if it's really critical, they're gonna work on it. You don't actually have to prioritize that stuff. And then you get down to the bottom of it, and you're trying to decide between like a beige priority and like a tan priority. It doesn't make any sense. You're spending so much work trying to do this other stuff. Um, so all of this stuff, I mean, they all have a place, but try and figure out if you can live without it. I think you can. I mean, you should try and resist metal work. It gets in the way of doing real work. 
because the real work will get done. Um, so I wanted to go into how we use issues a little bit. So we try and use them very simply. Um, we use them in one way, shit, something's broken. Make a new issue, and then this was closed within a few hours. Um, very simple, standard bug fix. Um, we also use them in terms of, hey, this could be cool. What if this? Um, and it's, it's, it's good because you don't actually have to throw down code. Um, it's more of getting somebody's reaction, like, is this a good idea? Is this a stupid idea? Is this you know, mediocre? Um, and it's, it's helpful to get people to attack your idea as fast as possible. Because the sooner somebody can attack your idea, the sooner it is you can get rid of it or improve it. Um, and then we also use it in terms of to-do lists sometimes, which is kind of an interesting way of doing things. Um, just sort of a cross-off and stuff. This means you don't have to create issues for every one of them. Uh, it's very minor, but it's also very nice because then it's, it's another step of making things very simple. It's just a simple text list. Um, so, you know, do you need more than that? Think about it. Um, really, I don't think you do a lot of ways. Um, again, this is not a universal, don't use issues as much as you guys do, but I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a mentality in developers that is like, well, I need more power, therefore I should have all these options because they're great. I think options suck. Like you should have a very opinionated piece of software, and that makes it a lot simpler down the line. Um, so simple tools makes more time building your product. I think that's really true. The less time you have to get out of the zone, again, uh, it's better because you spend more time doing real work. Um, yeah. So I also want to talk about OAuth as identity. Um, I love code. I really love code. I'm not talking about code being fast, like depends on the language and all that stuff. I don't care. I'm talking about building stuff nowadays is fucking awesome. Like we've got frameworks that have been in use for like a decade and stuff, and you can do really cool shit really quickly. That's awesome. How is that not awesome? <laughs> so I looked through my development folder, and I have one called Secretary of Labor, and it was all caps. I found this out one morning because I was super hammered the night before. And it's a simple web app uh, in Ruby, and it uses Sinatra, and had a self-referential sim link called what that linked to itself. I have no idea what this is, but it was really fun to build at that point. I also have something called Unmarked Man, which is an app that tracked people's physical locations, some sort of stocking thing. Um, and I also have a Redis-based graphing library. And the point is, like, I mean, none of those, none of these will ever ship anywhere, especially not that first one. <laughs> but the, the point is, like, we're using cool technologies now. I mean. Use the cutting edge. Use like Node and like do stuff for the sake of trying out stuff. It's really fast now, and you can do cool stuff. And we use that internally at GitHub a lot. I mean, we have like 30 apps, maybe it's even more at this point. Um, you know, from serious stuff to like CI to like we have an internal Twitter where we can post photos and animated GIFs and all this sort of stuff because it's fun to build these things. And we try to hire people that like to do this stuff on the side because you know some of these have direct uh, to ways of saying, okay, this if I build this app, this will make this person's job way easier, which is awesome. Sometimes we have stuff where if I build this app, this will be hilarious, and there's no reason to do this, which is also awesome. I think you should encourage all of that stuff. Um, but on a more serious note, I mean, all the stuff outside is not welcome. Um, we're a super open company, and we'll probably talk about mostly everything, but you still want some sort of privacy for this sort of stuff. Um, so for us, we use GitHub as authentication. Um, we already have all of our teams and organizations and users in GitHub, so we should use that to authenticate users. Um, and for that, we use OAuth, because OAuth is sort of the standard, and it's pretty, pretty simple to set up. So if you use GitHub, uh, this is our OAuth screen. Um, simple, allow or deny, give it access to certain parts of your profile. Um, there's lots of different ways to use this. Um, if you're using Ruby, this is a simple Sinatra app, that, or Sinatra plugin that will lets you do a one-line call of like, is this guy allowed in the GitHub organization, yes or no? Um, I mean, there's OAuth helpers in every language all over the place. Um, and that's helpful, because then we can include this to every app. I mean, we include it in there are Node apps, or Ruby apps, or you know, everything. Um, and it's helpful because then you don't have to deal with authentication. Um, you can sell all of your developers, you let the, in our case, GitHub handle the authentication, and you don't have to manage users in one place. Then you don't have to have you know, your privacy permissions all over the place. If you fire somebody, then you have to go back through every single app. It, it sucks. Have it in one place. Um, it's, it's better for security, it's better for consistency, and I guess it's cool. Um, this doesn't have to be a GitHub thing by any means. Um, I mean, most people are on Twitter nowadays, use Twitter, have a Twitter list, authenticate against that list. Um, you know, 
various ways. You can build your own OAuth uh, setup very easily. Um, so think about, you know, if you're already doing all this complex management, especially for small companies who don't use LDAP or anything more powerful than that, uh, think about other ways you can make get stuff and spread it, out, spread it out across all of your apps. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. Authentication can be very cheap and easy everywhere. Okay, um, I also want to talk about Hooks and Hubot. Um, anybody heard about Hubot yet? We talk about them sometimes. Hubot is our friendly campfire robot. We did draw an image of him. We spent time doing great things. But campfires are a chat room uh, that we spend basically all of our time in. Um, and Hubot has evolved into a lot of different things. He's a Node.js uh, made creation. He started out with a couple different things. And now we can do uh, 275 at least. I think this is probably like 290 now, 300. Um, it's very easy to build stuff. We encourage like designers or people who don't know Ruby, so mostly what uh, GitHub's written in, to take part in Hubot because it's fun. We just had our uh, business manager commit to Hubot. She doesn't know any JavaScript. It was awesome. Um, it's a good, fun, consolidated way to have side projects in the company. Um, so you can do a lot of stuff. You employ every GitHub app. Um, you don't actually have to learn the uh, nitty gritty of deploying. You can just say Hubot deploy GitHub to production, and he sends it off to 60 servers. And it's very simple from the end user point of view. Um, you can also run branch level tests, serious stuff like that. Uh, you can play music in the office. Uh, so if you want to hear like lines more set, um, save that. I don't know why you want to do that. Um, <laughs> you can tell us who's in the office based on physical presence. You say Hubot who's in the office, and it'll spit out their avatars. Um, Dynamically build usage graphs. Again, like I was talking about, you can graph uh, Twitter mentions versus like deploys and stuff. We have a whole slew of different things that Hubot can graph against, which is really powerful. Send us receive text messages. So if somebody's out of the office, you can say, hey, can you take a look at this or something like that? Um, you can mustache every image posted in the chat, which is super business relevant. Um, if you didn't know what that looks like, that looks like that. <laughs> Literally every image is fantastic. Um, Track who swears the most every day because it's fucking cool. Uh, you can rank by Twitter followers and like there's so much different stuff. And it's cool because it's fun to have a shared uh, thing to work on instead of a company, especially if you're a small company you're able to do that. Um, so if you don't have a bot, not everybody does, not everyone's in chat rooms and stuff, think about uh, having an internal app. Um, can you, your internal app deploy everything for you? Can you have um, one sort of central area of doing things? Can you figure out ways to automate stuff? and make things more fun. Uh, people start hitting work and you have to do really mundane shit. And that's, you know, from deploying the site to you know, crafting particular, uh, it doesn't even matter what it is, but it's, it sucks to have to do that stuff. So you can automate it, spend the time to automate it, and it pays off really quickly. Um, going back to like what we do for GitHub, um, we, we know our branch status in, uh, in this case. So we talked to you about what hasn't been deployed. And again, this is really important because we deploy a lot. And it's helpful to know, if I'm going to deploy right now, what else could be potentially impacting um, if it's uh, not been deployed yet. So he just returns a simple compare view, which shows all of the commits, all of the diffs, and very easily you can see from there. You can also do this on a particular branch. You know, what hasn't been deployed on this particular branch? Maybe you're going to deploy that branch directly. Um, this is all po uh, made possible because we know the SHA of the currently deployed code, which ends up being really powerful. Um, we just put that on site slash SHA, and you can see what's currently deployed. Um, you can use this all over the place. Use this in CI. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to know, you know what version to make out to all the app servers and stuff like that. Um, so think about doing something like that if you aren't already. Uh, there's also a bunch of stuff we do with our API just internally. Um, so I can ask it, what are the pull requests on this particular repository? Um, and then I'll spit back all of these. Um, you can do this for issues as well. It's sort of a nice way of figuring out, you know, of tracking what is left to do on your particular repository. Um, we also have stuff like bug days. Uh, every like two weeks or so, we'll have a bug day just to help clean out old issues and get the, the, the system stable. Um, so we have stuff like, how many issues do we close today for this particular repository? And I'll spit back the number of issues. And it's sort of a, a nice way to game your own company to try and make people you know, excited about closing stuff. People like to see this stuff empty. Uh, if you have like how many polls or, or how many poll requests are on this particular repo and it says none, that's sort of a good thing if people like, oh, well we shipped everything we had to ship on there. That's awesome. Um, it's fun to get people excited about these sorts of uh, parts of uh, 
working in your company. Um, so again, like think about what you have to do every time you automate that. Like the, the simple step of hiring somebody sometimes sucks. You have to set them up accounts in every single spot. Same thing with firing people. Like try and figure out how to you know automate that stuff. I think that's really helpful. Um, and again, like I think shared projects within a company is really cool too. You can get everybody hacking on one thing, possibly in a different language, which is also a cool way of doing things. Um, I think that's really helpful. Um, so the recap, I, I don't even know. You guys were pretty big. He actually knows where we are now, which is kind of weird. You can ask him about where it's at. It's pretty big. Um, so as the big recap, uh, all of this stuff, I mean, tools, process, it all combines to something really important. Um, this is the stuff that takes a while to figure out. This is the stuff that takes a while to figure out what works for your team. And again, like this stuff doesn't make itself visible right away. If there's a problem, very rarely does it jump out at you. It's, it's more like, okay, this stuff is really going to sap your energy over the next eight months. And unless you're constantly figuring out, okay, what can I improve? What can I simplify? What can I make better? Uh, it can really get a, a weight. So start thinking about that stuff as much as possible. I think that's awesome. Um, thank you. I would love to talk about this. Questions, all your fun stuff. So if I try and change the billing code and I open a pull request, 
I can usually know there's like two or three people who have worked on billing that I can ping and say, hey, can you review this for me? And then there's sort of a sort of tier four aspect of it of like, you're committing to my part of the code base. I want to make sure that's really good before you sort of mess up my stuff. And it, it's good to have that sort of defensive, you know, I want this to be good, therefore I want to help you make this work really well. But we don't have a particular um, you know, manager type to say like, I'm going to go through every pull request and make sure this works. Um, we sort of have like a director of engineering that's closest to that role, but he doesn't do it like that. It's mostly um, the few people who are in charge of that area will review it, and that works pretty well for us. What's happening when uh, your butt is going on vacation? Kubot never goes on vacation. <laughs> um, I don't know. Sometimes like campfire will go down, and then we're all sort of screwed. Um, we have um, like the mission critical stuff. We can deploy the site without Kubot. Um, you just do the manual command and stuff. It happens very rarely, but it certainly does happen. Um, we've never had a very extended time where like Kubot's been down or like campfire's been down. Um, if we do, I'm sure we'll figure out something out quick enough, like Jabber or email even or whatever. Um, but there's something to be said about not relying on a particular service 100%. Um, and the new version of Cubot will have multiple backends, so you can put it on you know, Jabber, IRC, whatever you want. So do you close the uh, view merge the pull request by clicking on the merge button, or do you then? It depends on what. The command line? Yeah, it depends on what the uh, commit is. Um, if it's a whole bunch of different stuff, like some of the stuff I showed today has lots of things going on, um, you'll probably want to merge it uh, locally using the command line just to make sure like your merges are okay, um, nothing, no surprising stuff. You may want to run tests. Uh, it's always good. Um, they're very simple stuff, like we use, uh, we have GitHub Services, which is an open source uh, repo that lets you clone all of our services and stuff. Those will usually just merge buttons because they're easy and you don't have to check them out every time. A lot of them are just documentation changes. Just merge button, that's easy. So the, the, the difference between clicking the merge button, which effectively does a merge, is that you get a merge, uh, merge commit. There, um, there are some people that prefer not to have all the branching in the history, so you would then have to manually create a branch and then pull and then do the values. Yeah. Yeah, can we have a fast forward option? That'd be awesome. That's come up a few times. Um, I think we <coughs> most people have been agreeable to that. It just hasn't, you know, been built yet. Um, I think that's that's like the the number one uh, newbie complaint about getting get out. It's just like, how do I update my fork and stuff like that? Because it is kind of complicated. So possibly. Were you saying something else? No, that's the, uh, that was cool. Was there any actual ones that you can enter this one? Uh, what was that? Was there a Linux or a Linux? Oh, um, yeah, Linus, you try this out for a couple things. I don't actually know if Linux is still on here. But yeah, there's a, there's a few projects that are still active. Yeah, I mean, you basically but said that uh, it was great for smaller projects. Um, and Linux is, I mean, a large project, and it goes without saying they're probably going to have very specific uh, processes in place where they want, you know, to check the crypt cryptographic hash of every commit and stuff. Um, but I mean, he had a lot of good feedback on GitHub in particular, and I mean, we um, he had a couple good ones on like email headers. And, like, Format of stuff and change the next day. So you know, it's it's good to have that sort of visibility and you know, someone who invented the thing you're using to use your product. So. No. The only like weird stuff that happens sometimes is like um, you, you see that one where uh, somebody had a typo in a commit and then ended up doing an RM, RF on slash. <laughs> and then his next commit was like, oops. <laughs> and then everybody started commenting and putting like meme images and stuff. That was, that, that sort of stuff is really hard for us because we have to computationally generate like the, the git commit and stuff and that made like the front page of Reddit. And stuff like that gets a little bit rough, but I mean, Linux in general was not a big deal for us for a long time. Um, for organizations and teams, do you plan to provide uh, uh, 
security access where a team can uh, read and write but cannot rewrite the history? Um, that's come up a couple of times in terms of like uh, force pushing uh, new histories and stuff. Um, I think it's a possibility. Uh, we have a self-hosted GitHub, GitHub FI that would let you do that a little bit better. Uh, but I'm not sure if that will make it into github.com proper yet. Um, but it's a possibility. It's come up a number of times. I think it's uh, quite important for collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true.